So if you could just state your name for the camera. I'm Frank Doolittle, and uh, <laughs> Don and Emily invited me to, to uh, divulge my wartime flying experiences. So would you give us also, so your name and place of birth? Frank Doolittle, I was born right here in Windsor in uh, December the 22nd, 1923. Uh, <laughs> what else do you want to know? All right, I think you can just go right ahead and start reading your your story. Well, uh, when I turned 18, that was in December, 41, of course, uh, after working on war work in a machine shop, as I was a machinist apprentice. <laughs> Twelve hours a day, seven days a week, for ten months solid, I decided to join the RCAF. But it had to be air crew. My education was insufficient <laughs> until I uh, completed a pre-enlistment course at government expense in Ottawa. And I graduated, I passed that. After basic training in Lachine, Quebec, uh, and instruction at Eglinton Hunt Club in Toronto, I was posted to number seven EFTS in Windsor. Well, I got to fly, but only with an instructor. Uh, I guess it wasn't a natural. Or was it that I found a new love that I crawled under the fence for a few times? <laughs> they suggested I go air bomber special so that I might get uh, to use what flying experience I had. And also I trained in all the air crew positions, maybe briefly, but uh, master the air bomber's duties. That suited me fine because I was always kind of diversified. <laughs> After a brief posting to Toronto again, I was posted to Jarvis Bombing and Gunnery School where I learned a lot about bombs and how to get them on the target. Practicing from Avril Anson's, dropping smoke bombs and and flash bombs at night. At least I was flying. I thought I might be getting to use my parachute training, which had involved instruction and sliding down a wire from the rafters in the hangar. Excuse <laughs> me. But uh, the Anson pilot ordered me in no uncertain terms, prepare myself for a crash landing. He put, it down, put down the Anson in a small field and it fixed him flew it out the next day. Oh, gunnery was fun too, shooting at uh, the rifle range and shooting at drogues. To, uh, towed by Lysanders from Bristol, Bristol Bowling Brooks. I guess I was leading just a little too much as I shut the drogue off once. I can uh, understand, yeah, I can understand why they had such a long table between the Lysander and the drogue. Uh, instruction from Billy Bishop it didn't help me much, but cool. I did get acceptable marks and moved on to navigation, aerial photography, wireless. I did enjoy sending and receiving Morse code by key and Aldous lamp, etc. <coughs> I did get into a link trainer periodically just to keep my flying 
skills up. Maybe I should have a glass of water. Sure. <laughs> You're gonna be able to fun. Yeah. Okay, go. I graduated at number four AOTS Crumlin. That's the London Airport. And Billy Bishop uh, presented me with my wing. I don't know, I guess he was a colonel or, or a, a wing commander or better now. After a two-week embarkation leave uh, in Windsor, which really clinched me with my sweetie, I went to Halifax and I was posted to Bournemouth, England, a Canadian reception base. It was a peacetime tourist and vacation city, but there was no luxuries or elevators for us. And I learned that loaded kit bags don't bounce as a terminal velocity from my third floor balcony was enough to split it wide open, scattered the contents. Uh, we were on our way to Wigtown, Scotland, number one uh, OAFU. Uh, we're uh, racked up another 36 hours in Anson's, dropping practice bombs, uh, infrared bombing, and other training. I was RAF now. Now, and uh, I shivered <laughs> the six or seven weeks in Wigtown. It was December, very damp and freezing or close to it. I was glad to get posted south <clears throat> to the husband's Bosworth and Market Harbor, number 14 OTU, where we partially crewed up flying Wimpy, well, Wellington Wimpies, we nicknamed them Wimpies, for 110 hours. They flew. At number 14 OTU, we did a lot of circuits, air firing, high level practice bombing, map reading, navigation, night flying training, and a lot of ground school work and aircraft recognition. Now we'll be getting into the big stuff. And as we're posted to 1661 conversion unit near Scampton to fly Sterling bombers, which I called the flying boxcar. And we put 50 hours in, 30% of it night flying. I recall vividly our first cross country and high-level bombing exercise it was a little exciting. As Jack, our Scotch engineer, he miscalculated the fuel consumption of those four big radial engines when at 18,000 feet the port outer engine quit. Nisbet, our Australian skipper, ordered feather the starboard at the port outer and, uh, and then uh, the port inner quit, and the starboard inner, and the starboard outer. Mm -hmm. Then came the order, bail out, bail out, bail out. The Sterling note glide well with dead engines. I managed to get my parachute hooked on and was struggling to get the escape hatch open when Jock Beller no, told it all that I got it. As he switched fuel tanks, the three windmilling props came to life. I think we pulled out about 3,000 feet. There's no mention of this in our log books. <laughs> <laughs> well, we graduated from Sterling Bombers after a few harrowing experiences 
and we're posted to uh, number 5 LFS near Syreston. Where is that? It's Syreston <clears throat> in southern England. Mm. Where we were introduced to the Lancaster. We were only three, oh, ten days getting checked out in the length three. Exercises one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and <laughs> a total of 13 hours, that's all. Uh, four of which were night work. Now to our squadron, number 50, RAF, of course, at Skellingthorpe near Lincoln in Lincolnshire. We did three cross-country flights practicing bombing and navigation and fighter affiliation and we're off on ops the next day. After five of the hottest targets, two days and three nights, and we're diverted to Fog free Scotland. The skipper got promoted from flight sergeant to pilot officer. And I got promoted to warrant officer. But we didn't have much time to celebrate as the weather cleared enough to get airborne and another night raid on Cottingsbury. I think that was the time the searchlights nearly got us. It just took, i just seen it uh, go on our wingtip there, and the skipper put the plane in such a violent corkscrew that they couldn't find us again. I know it was violent because my leather helmet wasn't enough to stop me from getting a goose egg when I flew up into the turret. When the plane came down, put the nose down, I bumped the nose and I flew up into the turret well enough to hit my head. The corkscrew might as well. Uh, no, if, if one search light gets you, you might as well say you're down because immediately two or three are on you. And if you can get out of the range of those first ones, more would pick you up until they got you down. I think that was the first time I pissed my pants. <laughs> but it wasn't the last. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't seem like we got much time for recreation. But I remember one incident. Jock, our flight engineer, and I were out on the town. As we got to base, we spotted a lorry, that's the English word for, for truck, <laughs> with uh, four new Merlins on it. Merlins are the engines we used in the Lancaster. Uh, one of us suggested, we'll give the Merlins a ride. They were always giving us a ride. When Jock <laughs> at the wheel, and me at the gear shift. Or was it the other way around? Well, we drove that thing all around the base until the SPs got on our tail. When we decided to park in amongst the barracks and skillfully lost the SPs. <laughs> I don't know, I'm free to tell this now because I'm in my 90th year. <laughs> I have to tell you how I learned that the skipper was hiding a medical handicap. Mm -hmm. One beautiful day, on a daylight raid, I experienced a spray coming down on me from the pilot's area. So I inquired, hey skipper, how come it's raining down here and it ain't raining outside? I never did get a reply, but I got more time at the controls. <laughs> well, he got more time on the can and the tail. <laughs> One 
night on a long run over France and down into Italy because sometimes we would go down there uh, and surprise the enemy by coming in through the mountains. I was getting tired of flying straight and level. And the skipper was sitting on the cab and I decided to put George in. George's automatic pilot. Well, it locked in good on heading, stayed on heading, and uh, the lateral control. And uh, but it didn't want to come back to my programmed altitude because it, it, it descend a little bit and then it would come back onto the right altitude. It didn't seem to want to come back when I got a blast from the tail. Doolittle, what's going on up there? <laughs> Just putting George in, Skipper. No, 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 take it out. Don't work. <laughs> I guess I lost 500 feet. <laughs> Well, after that, he clued me in a little better. And, well, I guess even new planes have glitches. Another instance sticks in my mind. When the navigator screamed at the top of his lungs, Let's get the hell out of here! <laughs> we were over at Dusseldorf, and the skipper was having a hard time getting me on the target, over the target avoiding searchlights run I think twice that's when the navigator screamed because he can't see what's going on I was afraid he might have gone into shock as I've seen it happen but he brought us back we did get our cookie on the target and the incendiaries where the cookie made the kindling the cookie well it's a uh, a big bomb. <laughs> and the incendiaries, of course, the, the bomb would, would go along uh, below us practically, and the incendiaries would just float, flutter down. They're just magnesium. We never really encountered enemy fires. As we searched diligently, and if we spotted one, we would let fly a few rounds of tracer from our turrets and they'd go and look for somebody else. I hope we didn't chase any spits or hurricanes away. We were very fortunate that we uh, didn't uh, lose our rear gunner once as a piece of shrapnel went through his turret where his head would have been if he hadn't been leaning forward, searching. <laughs> they had that patched up for our next scheduled flight. We often uh, did one night raid, one day raid, for three days, not hit the sack. Just get your head down on the table, maybe. Wakey wakey pills, they worked well, but the skipper did catch me sleeping once. <laughs> I gotta admit that. <laughs> Maybe I was a bit of a loner, because whenever we did get leave to go off, I would go off on my own. But uh, no trouble making friends. One night in London, I got a very pleasant surprise. I feel sure now that this was an act of God. I was standing in a store alcove in the pitch black. <laughs> you couldn't see your head in front of your face. When I heard people talking in the next store alcove, the voice was familiar. So I called out, Bob Little! And Frank Doolittle came back to reply. 
the best friend that I had made all the time in the Air Force. We did a navigation course together in uh, London. We never got together again since. He had two nice girls on the hook there. So we did London Town together. I was very saddened to hear later that their crew didn't return from a raid. I did get to, to do, find his parents in Ottawa and offer my condolences. Another night in London, well, I don't remember the night really, but I was awakened by the manager of the Dutchie Hotel trying to get my door open. Apparently it was jammed. And I was lying on the floor with all the bedding on top of me. A buzz bomb had landed close by, and my windows were open to the ceiling, but no broken glass. Occasionally, uh, we flew over Norway and Sweden uh, to approach from a different direction, and the skipper it didn't seem he was at all concerned about the flak that they were sending up. He did no evasive <laughs> maneuvers. But I'm sure if a German aircraft had flown over, their accuracy would have improved greatly. They were neutral, Norway and Sweden. Referring to my logbook, uh, list some of our targets. Stetten, Dormstadt, Konigsberg, La Havre, Boulogne, uh, Bermerhaven, Wright, Munster, Dirksman, Dirksman, Ems Canal, Karlsruhe, Bremen, Kaiserslautern, Wilhelmshaven, Flushing, Brunswick, Bergen, Homburg, Harburg, Dusseldorf, Mitterland Canal, Munich, Held Brown, Gießen. I would consider them all pretty hot targets. But we were a pretty hot crew, too. <laughs> I wasn't 21 yet, and I was the oldest one in the crew. We were fearless, and I think that might have helped us get them through. One experience was sticking in my mind, even though I wasn't involved. I witnessed uh, two Pathfinder Mosquito bombers collide over Lincoln while I was on the town. I've never seen fireworks to equal that. One plane just exploded and the other, you could see it spiraling down in the, in all the the light coming from all those uh, flares and that that all set off at the same time. It was a sight. And uh, those things happen, I suppose, but uh, certainly never advertised. And these were two of the, the best going down. Well, uh, that pretty well concluded my ops. I completed 31 operational trips. I was awarded a little gold wing, operational wing, that I cherished. I was put in charge of a bombing range. While I was a warrant officer, 
I had to be put in charge of something until transportation home became available. Adrian, our skipper, was awarded the DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross, probably because I called Dummy Run a few times and he had the guts to take me around again. So we got the bombs on the target. Flying was in my blood now. They asked me of these flying experiences, if you want me to elaborate, or any of my civilian experiences that I encountered over the following 68 years. Believe me, there were a few. Here's our crew. Thirty-one, you said? Thirty-one flying missions? Thirty-one we completed, yeah. That's amazing. And uh, the names of our crew were uh, Noel Ogram, the wireless operator, uh, Gregaines, I forget his first name. He was the mid-upper gunner. Dennis Smith was the navigator. Adrian Nisbet, he was our skipper. Sonny Green was the rear gunner. Alex Fraser, our engineer. And Frank Doolittle, that's me. Air bomber, what we call air bomber special because I could take pretty much any position in the plane. What did and, you uh, say was the, um, the medical condition of your skipper? He had a he was hiding a medical condition? Yeah, he had a bladder problem. No. Oh. <laughs> you didn't get that. Oh, I got it now. <laughs> oh, you got it on there. Okay. I got feet on. Oh, boy. <laughs> and are you still on there? Yeah, it's still on. It's still recording. Well, the bottom picture shows uh, uh, a 4,000 pound, what we call cookie, 4,000 pound bomb, uh, and incendiaries. And I got it uh, uh, down here, it's a uh, 4,000 pound cookie and incendiaries for Konigsberg, October okay. 44. I'll take a picture of that afterwards. <laughs> 